I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, a legislative proposal introduced in the United States Senate that would affect U.S. military aid to Israel. The Senate proposal is in the form of an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act and would restrict U.S. security to Israel if Israel extends sovereignty over parts of the West Bank. In essence, this Senate amendment would prevent Israel from utilizing U.S.-funded equipment, including missile defense systems like the Iron Dome, to protect Jews living on the West Bank. In addition, this amendment also increases the growing partisan divide on Israel, since it's offered only by Democratic members of the Senate. The amendment was introduced by Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen and was co-sponsored by Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, Vermont Senators Bernie Sanders and Patrick Leahy, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, New Mexico Senators Tom Udall and Martin Heinrich, Hawaii Senator Brian Schatz, Delaware Senator Tom Carper, Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin, Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine, and Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown. Again, all 13 senators are Democrats. The Senate amendment comes after similar actions taken by House Democrats. 191 House Democrats signed a letter opposing any Israeli attempt to extend sovereignty over parts of the West Bank. And in May, 19 House Democrats warned Prime Minister Netanyahu against taking steps that would, quote, fray our unique bonds, imperil Israel's future, and place out of reach the prospect of a lasting peace, unquote. On top of all this, Democratic Congresswoman of New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, is seeking legislation that would put conditions on America's entire $3.8 billion in U.S. military funding to Israel. Well, where do attempts to extend Israeli sovereignty over parts of the West Bank stand now? And how concerned need American Jews be over the Democratic-sponsored actions taken by House and Senate members. For some answers, I'm happy to be joined by the former member of the Israeli Diplomatic Corps, who's now, I'm so pleased to say, JBS's Senior Vice President, Shahar Azami. Shahar, first of all, so good to see you. Always a pleasure, Mark, to be back with you and with, with our JBS viewers. So, Shahar, let's start from the beginning. Before we go to the legislation or the amendment proposed in the Senate, where is Israel now in terms of extending sovereignty over parts of the West Bank? Well, to quote uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu a few days ago, the discussions of extending sovereignty over parts of the West Bank is not set for July 1st, but will begin on July 1st, because at the moment, Israel is immersed in an intense crisis of a great and significant magnitude as a result of COVID-19, both as a result of a significant spike in various parts of the country in uh, the disease itself, as well as the economic ramifications, the unemployment and small businesses that have been coping with this terribly tragic situation. So the prime minister, as indicated by many statements that's coming out of his office in the past couple of days, is busy building up a new economic plan for June 2020 to June 2021 to assist all of these people who are in great, great um, trouble. And in Israeli media, there are rampant images of people who are suffering, uh, stealing food from supermarkets and getting ready for big demonstrations this coming Saturday night as a result of these dire straits. Let's talk about this for one moment, then we'll come back to sovereignty. When you talk about demonstrations, and there are some people suggesting that people are threatening violence in Israel, 
for so long, Israel was touted as having been one of the countries that did the best in dealing with the coronavirus. Then they opened things up, and it seems, Shachar, everything's fallen apart. And in some way, it is now reminiscent of what we see on the streets of America, but for very different reasons. When we hear people talking about violence, in your mind, is it possible that we will see Israelis literally being violent or rioting in the streets because of what economic ramifications the coronavirus is having on Israel? So we haven't seen it so far, but in the past couple of days, Mark, we have been hearing voices and threats from various directions, especially looking into Saturday night's uh, potential demonstration, that there may be some elements of violence or unorderly beha- disorderly behavior. And especially you hear a lot in the past week about the cry of the cultural world in Israel, of the many people behind the scenes who work as part of that scene, who are in terrible, terrible pain, and who are aching the fact that the government has not proposed a solution for their pain, which is why the expectation was, by the way, the prime minister was supposed to come up with this plan two days ago, and there had been a delay. The anticipation is that the Prime Minister will come out possibly even tonight with a major announcement and press conference to the Israeli public, especially looking into Saturday night, because we are trying our best, and I'm sure the Israeli government will do its best to make sure that there will be no need for violence. However, the Israeli public is very disappointed in this national unity government, which is nicknamed, by the way, the Corona government, in the way it's been handling the crisis, and in the lack of solutions, while at the same time, they find every possible reason to bicker in the Knesset. So while the ordinary Israeli, who's been out of work for a few months, who saw a glimmer of hope only a few weeks ago as if things are going to go back to normal, suddenly hears about new limitations because of the spike, and at the same time, instead of receiving some sort of assistance, is seeing the Knesset being this... uh, continuous political brawl, which is very disappointing. And what would people be violent over? What's their goal on the streets of Israel? Well, I can tell you that um, it's not in the Israeli nature to tear up statues' heads or to uh, rewrite pasts. What Israelis are aching for is food on the table. We are a forward-looking people. The pain that people are experiencing now is real and current and relates to their lack of ability to provide for their, for their families and for their homes, which is the reason why they want their voices heard. And the threats of violence are connected to that, that desire. Toward to what end? Toward what end would violence get them closer to food? Well, again, I'm not a proponent of violence, but their claim is we've been um, good kids up to now just demonstrating and carrying flags, and yet the government has continued to deal with its own political issues without finding solutions for us. Maybe when we try some, some of the disorderly conduct, somebody up there will listen to us and we will actually get results. For instance, when people call to the hotline to, pre- to present their Uh, needs to national security, when uh, people are presented with a demand to be in quarantine, even though they have have not been in contact with anyone, or there is a problem with the facts as presented to them by the Israeli police, and they're calling to the governmental call center, no, nobody replies. There is no answer. They can be on the line for two hours, nobody would reply. What would happen is, if they're unable to appeal the decision to remain in quarantine, and they come out, it's a fine and a very expensive one. But So what happens when this individual who received this error message that supposedly they've been somewhere they had not, and they need to go to work, and they're supposed to stay in quarantine? So if they leave their house and they weren't able to appeal, they're going to get a fine. But if they don't leave their house, they can't go to work. It's an impossible reality. Mark. Okay. And very difficult. And I still don't understand. The violence would be against whom? Police, against property, indif- what? against the government's indifference. They claim that the government has been indifferent to their pain. But who, without who are you going to be violent against? 
demonstrations are as demonstrations go. So it would be probably vis-a-vis -vis the police, and the police is the one that's being uh, prepared to deal with those potential interruptions, again, with the hope that we don't have to reach there. Because, again, if the government is able to present Israelis with solutions, there will be no need for violence. But the problem is that the problem has grown so severe in Israel. The, the cries that come out, and you were absolutely correct, Mark, the problem was that we, Israel did very well at the beginning, and then open up was incredibly quick, like a slippery slope because of political pressures, and I'll tell you something else, something that annoys Israelis very much, and that is when they are demanded to stay in-house, to remain in quarantine, to socially distance, not to engage, and they hear that the uh, Minister of Health, Yuli Edelstein, formerly the Speaker of Knesset, decides to continue with a birthday celebration for his wife, to which dozens of people were invited. At times when people are not allowed to converge, not even for family simchas or for events in, in banquet halls or stand-up comedy routines or any other public uh, conference. And the Israeli public looks at this and says, excuse me, you're demanding something of me that you do not uphold. If you remember during Pesach, we had similar issues with the prime minister. When his son Avner came, we had a similar issue with President Ruvi Rivlin. And some of the Israeli public has had enough. All right. Come now back to the issue of the Senate amendment. Um, I was asking, basically, are you saying to me that at the moment, the whole question of extending sovereignty over the West Bank has been put on hold? Or are you saying something else? Are you saying, Shahar, that the issue has sort of evaporated and at the moment, even after the coronavirus is dealt with, this issue will no longer be front and center on the Israeli scene. No, the, the reality is that whether it's due to the coronavirus or for another reason, the Israeli public was not enthused by the issue of uh, sovereignty extension. There had been criticism of the move from right to left. There hasn't been a, a, a united voice even within the national unity government, whereas the against faction of blue and white did not agree with Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud. I do not think, though, Mark, that this is merely a smokescreen. I think there is a, a real issue here that's definitely going to go come back on the table. But at the moment, COVID-19 takes uh, front stage, and we don't know for how long that's going to be. Let's hope that for the shortest time possible, because we all yearn to go back to the same old, same old. Absolutely. All right, speak about an issue that we've heard discussed within the American Jewish community, the question of language. There are people who argue that the word annexation and the words to extend sovereignty over have very different meanings and that the word annexation is a word with negative overtones and somehow extending sovereignty doesn't have those overtones. I want you to first explain to the audience what are the difference between those two terms in Hebrew? Uh, in Hebrew, are the terms as different as they sound in English? And then, you know, based on all of your experience within the diplomatic corps, what's your sense of the discussion between extending sovereignty over or annexation? Well, I can tell you first that um, the in, in Hebrew, the extension of sovereignty, hachalat ribonut, and annexation, sipuach, are very much similar. And in Israel, you would use both terms um, to, to discuss the actual deed, which is extending sovereignty over part of the West Bank. And I have to tell you, on a personal level, I think extension of sovereignty is much more relevant, respectful, and indeed true, because that's exactly what sipuach, annexation, means, that Israel is extending its sovereignty. So let's be clear about this. When it comes to the uh, American discussion, it's clear that some view the word annexation as some sort of a a slight or a tendency to criticize the move by Israel because it's taking over somewhat forcefully and unjustifiably, whereas extension of sovereignty, but here it is. At the end of the day, that's exactly what Israel is doing. Israel is extending sovereignty to parts of the West Bank that are, will remain in the hands of Israel, whichever settlement we, we reach. 
But there is a bigger question here than just a question of annexation or extension of sovereignty. And the question is, where is Waldo? Where is Walid? Where are the Palestinians, Mark? Because it seems, if you read the papers, both here and in Israel and internationally, who is discussing the issue of extending sovereignty? It's Benjamin Netanyahu and Benny Gantz trying to reach an agreement. It's Gabi Ashkenazi, the foreign minister, with the German uh, foreign minister. It's Angela Merkel and Benjamin Netanyahu. It's the United Nations, uh, Gutierrez, and the ambassador, Danny Danone. It's the U.S. administration with various voices and Israel. But where are the Palestinians in all of this? Nobody seems to be even asking that question. I think that at the very foundation of any movement in the Middle East, there has to be the understanding that the Palestinians, they need to care about this. They need to want this. And if they don't want this, then Israel cannot hold its future hostage to their intransigence or their delusions that somehow Israel will vanish off the face of the earth. And somebody has to pose this important question. Okay. What you'll hear in America is the following response, even from American Jews. The understanding we have is that Israel is, whether it's annexation or extending sovereignty, it's doing it unilaterally. That it has made this decision without even needing, from Israel's perspective, or caring about what the Palestinians want or feel the attitude is Israel has been willing to enter a two-state solution basically since before the state was established. And the response from the Palestinian world is summarized by what the Arab League said in 1967 at Khartoum. No peace, no negotiation, no recognition. That basically the idea of a Palestinian government wanting to live alongside the Israeli Jewish state of Israel is something that is of, they just don't want at all. And there, you and I have discussed this. Their mantra is, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And so Israel says, you know, under those circumstances, we're going to take a unilateral action and extend sovereignty or an X, whatever you, word you want to use, parts of the West Bank, which we believe would become part of a Jewish state, even if there were a two-state solution. So when you say, where are the Palestinians? In this context, that question seems to be moot. What's your answer? Uh, I, it's a very important point to, to stress, Mark, for our viewers as well, to understand that even now, when you're talking about the unilateral move, the Israeli government, both Benjamin Netanyahu and the alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz, have stressed continuously that they invite the Palestinians to negotiate, that peace will not emanate from Rome, Geneva, or New York. It will come between Ramallah and Jerusalem 45 minutes away. And in the case, the only difference is this. If the Palestinians choose not to engage, things will change. And that is the paradigm shift that the Trump administration has presented continuously that, to be honest, has been a refreshing change. For once, the Palestinians cannot hold Israel and the region and the world hostage to their entrenchedness and insist insistence on not moving forward. Now, I'm not only talking about Israel. You saw that in the Trump administration moving forward with moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Now, the Palestinians refused to engage. The result was they lost. Not only did they lose, they lost their ability to influence those moves, and they even refused not only to engage with Israel, they refused to negotiate with the United States of America, their major benefactor and supporter by the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, that is an unparalleled level of chutzpah. Now, what happened as a result of their intransigence and, and this paradigm shift was that not only Israel is willing to come forward and say, if you're willing to negotiate, wonderful, let's talk. But if you're not, we will not wait for you. The train will leave the station and things will happen. So you have a chance to have an influence. But if you choose not to, you will lose. And that's a very important message. And look at the Arab world, for instance, Mark. Even the Arab states, you go back to the no, 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 no. But even the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia, have we have witnessed a significant thaw of relations between Israel and these countries because they decided 
to put their interests ahead of the Palestinian intransigence so that they're no longer hostages to the Palestinians. They're sick and tired of the Palestinians being insistent on doing absolutely nothing, and they're telling them, you will not control our fate. Now, look back to the Obama administration. I want to remind our viewers one unilateral step. And that step was at the request of the Obama administration that Israel will freeze building in the towns and cities in the West Bank. That was done without any reward from the Palestinians, without any kind of quid pro quo. It was done voluntarily by Israel as a confidence building measure throughout the Obama administration. We have seen the world and the international community advocating for the Palestinians in more ways than they advocated for themselves. Mahmoud Abbas did not ask for freezing the settlements. It was the American president. So how can we, how can he be expected to be, you know, more Catholic than the Pope? You already had the American asking this, so I'm, okay, I'll go along. And where did that lead us? To a monumental loss of time. So we're hoping that maybe this change of approach will lead the Palestinians to think a bit differently. And you know what, Mark, I'll just tell you between you and I, you're hearing voices in the Arab media now that the Palestinians are willing to put something on the table. They're coming up with a plan of their own. They're actually moving. They're moving for Trump more than they moved for John Kerry. Fascinating. Are you concerned now, Shachar, about a loss of partisan support for Israel? And what would you say to American Jews who are both passionately committed to the well-being and survival of the state of Israel, and they're also deeply committed to the Democratic Party? I, I'll tell you, Mark, that yes, first of all, I am worried. I believe in the bipartisan support of Israel. I believe Israel is an American value. I believe in what former UN ambassador, um, US, the United States UN ambassador Susan Rice and national security advisor said when the agreement for the military aid was signed under Obama. She said in 2016, when that agreement was signed, a safe Israel is a safe United States of America. And it's important for all of our viewers to hear this, especially with regards to the amendment offered now, because even the Obama administration that had humongous disagreements with Netanyahu and the Israeli government when it comes to politics knew to draw the line between the political soup de jour and the security, which is so important for the U.S. and Israel, as Israel is a significant ally and the only major ally of the United States in that region, which presents unbelievable dangers to the world, from Iran to Syria to Iraq to Lebanon, and God knows the options there are infinite. So there has to be a line drawn, and to the American Jewish community, that's committed to the Democratic Party. I urge you today to make your voice heard within your camp, to charge again and claim your place, because it seems like the place of Israel is lost in the ranks of the ultra-progressive parts of that camp. When a couple of years ago in the Dyke March, it was inappropriate to carry a Star of David in a country that is a bastion of LGBTQ rights in the Middle East, Israel, that is a hub for so many who escape into Israel, Israel to find refuge for themselves and their families and their souls, and you tell Israel and the world that we are contradictory to social justice, if that is important to you, then all of you who are part of the Democratic Party, you have a special vestige point to rescue the place of Israel, to reclaim the just and, uh, and proper right of Israel, because it's very important that Israel does not become a partisan issue and it's clear to me from this amendment and from other trends that many are heading in that direction to try and make Israel into a, another issue of political disagreement in the US which will not only hurt Israel Mark but will also hurt the United States of America. Beautifully said Shahar. By the way Peter Beinart has published a piece in the New York Times saying he has now given up on the two-state solution. And it's not clear exactly what he does support, whether it's, it's not really a binational state, but he wants there to be one state. Everybody gets to vote. But he acknowledges that in that situation, Israel will give up being, quote, the Jewish state. Peter Beinert, his children have the Israeli flag in their bedroom. His children go to the Heschel Day School in New York. 
Although Peter Byron has been an outspoken critic of Israel, he has been one who has loved the state of Israel. And now we read this in the New York Times, and I'm hoping I can get Peter to come on JBS and discuss it with me. But what's your response when you see someone with that kind of name recognition arguing the two-state solution is dead and therefore there should be a state in which the Jewish character of Israel is lost. Well, I have to tell you, Mark, it, it, it's a great... First of all, it's lovely to see the editorial decisions of the New York Times, you know, Tom Cotton and beyond. I'm just wondering if anybody would uh, give them a racket as a result of, you know, somebody pinning an op-ed trying to eradicate the Jewish state. Because let's call it what it is. Uh, if When you're creating such a scenario in which the Jews become a minority, there is no more Jewish state in, a, in less than a, a generation. So we have to look reality in the eye and acknowledge it. And I have to say I am in a dire disagreement with Peter Beinart. I think it's a great way to attract attention. I think the Twitter feed will go berserk. I think it's impractical, unrealistic, and quite honestly shameful because looking at Israel only through the prism of the Palestinian issue and that is the only raison d'etre of Israel. If there is a solution for the Palestinian issue, there is Israel. And if there is no solution to the Palestinian issue, there is no Israel, is ridiculous and undermines what the state of Israel is, a celebration of Jewish society, an unbelievably flourishing community of people who are busy day-to-day -day creating, building, developing, and definitely not, as he describes it, fretting notions of annihilation. Because I assure you, we do not. It's, to me, it reminds me of the cancel culture, right? It doesn't work. Let's just be done with it. It's kind of like, this is what's happening here. We just have to abort it. There is no abort. The, the third temple shall not fall. Israel is strong, prosperous, and powerful, and will continue to be so. And if Peter Beinart thinks that by eradicating uh, Jewish statehood, this will bring any kind of salvation, he is utterly wrong. Again, beautifully said, Shahar. And again, I hope Peter's willing to come on and explain this to us. Um, it's a shame, though, because if you remember, I don't want to compare Peter Baina to anyone, but there was another a major Middle Eastern philosopher by the name of Muammar Gaddafi, if you remember that lovely chap from Libya. And he also penned an op-ed, by the way, in the New York Times. And I think the name was Isristein. And Israelstein called upon a solution to create one country between the Jordan and the sea that's going to be for Jews and Palestinians. So are we seeing a Muammar? You know, all I'm saying is I'm putting it in front of our viewers. Israelstein it is. Well said. Shachar, it's always wonderful to talk to you. You know, I say it over and over again. We're thrilled that you're part of JBS. I love what you do. So I'll just keep, you know, you and I will just keep talking and sharing your views with the JBS audience. In the meantime, you and your family stay well, all right? Thank you very much, and it's always a pleasure and super important to be such an intimate guest in so many people's homes, which really energizes us pre-COVID-19, during COVID-19, and long, long after COVID-19. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Thank you, Shachar. Be well. The thoughts of JBS's Senior Vice President, Shachar Azani, and he gives us a sense of what's going on in Israel like no one else can. I, I really hope you've enjoyed listening to him once again and, more importantly, learning from him. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Stay safe and be well, my friends. Thank you.